to take children and chopping off the heads. His head was chopped off. Cutting babies' heads off. Lies, graphic fabrications, and gory disinformation to manipulate public opinion. That is how atrocity propaganda functions. Following Hamas's surprise cross-border attack on October 7, Israel used this strategy to turn the tide in its favor. With the help of a group influenced by Zionist ideologies called Zaka. And now Zaka is interesting because it uh, finds itself involved in all sorts of allegations of, of effectively making up atrocity propaganda. So the stories about the 40 beheaded babies, the mass rape, the cutting of a fetus from its mother's belly, all of these things seem to have been uh, fabricated by Zaka. Founded in the early 90s by Yehuda Meshi Zahav, Zaka has the stated objective of integrating Israel's ultra-Orthodox community, known as Haredim, who typically reject Israeli state policies on religious grounds, into the framework of Zionism. Dubbing itself as a search and rescue organization, the community group consists largely of ultra-religious amateur volunteers, who see themselves as performing the sacred work of saving lives and honoring the dead in accordance with Jewish law. But the group, described by an Israeli journalist as militia, has been riddled with controversies. From its founder being engulfed in a series of scandals related to alleged sexual abuse and the pocketing of millions of dollars of donations meant for Zaka, to the group being caught smuggling 200-year-old Jewish manuscripts from Turkey to Israel during a rescue mission after the twin earthquakes that struck southern Turkey in 2023. And it doesn't stop there. The group has also been accused of ego wars with other rescue groups, vying for donations and media visibility. The ego wars are fought according to who is first to arrive on the scene of an emergency, who is first to get a hold of photographs, and who is first to make an announcement. In short, the group that sells the atrocity first, and sells it better, wins more visibility and gains the upper hand. And that's exactly what happened on October 7. She was a pregnant woman. Her stomach was butchered open. Two children, a boy and a girl, hands tied in the back. They were tortured, both of them. A recent investigation by Haaretz has revealed that on October 7, Zaka spread accounts of atrocities that never happened acted unprofessionally on the ground, and released sensitive and graphic photos of the site. The report goes on to say that Zaka turned the October 7 site into a war room for donations and used corpses as fundraising props. And part of the agenda appears to be they want to uh, raise money for their activities. Um, uh, so they want to appear as if they're doing some good. So that part of the, the rationale for the propaganda may well be uh, yes, the, the uh, aim to make money. Before October 7, Zaka was on the verge of bankruptcy. Yet since Israel launched its war on Palestine's Gaza, the group has managed to rake in at least $13.7 million in donations in four months. It was a 13-year-old, I would say 13-year-old boy. His head was chopped off. We found him with no head. Yossi Landau, head of Zaka's operation in southern Israel, fabricated this lie and parroted it on several media platforms. The story was later debunked by numerous media outlets, including Israeli networks, conceding that his account was fictional when another Zaka member claimed that dozens of dead babies and children were bound together and burnt Israeli forces quickly peddled these allegations without any concrete evidence to back them. We find a concentration of eight babies burned among 15 other people. Others from the group claim to have collected the remains of people who had been raped, while some allege that they had found a sexually mutilated woman's corpse with their organs removed under the rubble. But here's a fact. Zaka has admitted that its volunteers are not pathology experts and that they lack the expertise to conduct forensic testing and physically examine victims for sexual assault. They have also been accused of mixing body parts and contaminating crime scenes, thus botching evidence. Here's another shocker. 
An official from Zaka has also suggested that the group relied on their imagination to determine what happened. Israeli authorities haven't been able to verify the allegations Zaka leveled about what happened on October 7, nor which victims could have been subjected to the acts Zaka alleges happened. So why were these claims taken at face value by the West, and why wasn't the group's credibility questioned? Zaka boasts of being an independent, non-governmental organization without any political agenda. But after October 7, Zaka volunteers were reportedly recruited by the Israeli state to participate in Hasbara, a component of the state strategy that uses disinformation and lies to shape and control narratives related to Israel. Here is what Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told Zaka volunteers in November 2023. <laughs> There's something deeper. When Benjamin Netanyahu went to visit them uh, in November last year, he said, you know, let's remember that, that uh, we will fight on against uh, Hamas until we are defeated. But in order to do that, we need time. We need to be given time to maneuver. And one of the ways to, to get that time is to win a battle for public opinion internationally, which he said, um, Zaka, played a key role in doing so. Netanyahu began likening Hamas to Daesh, a manipulative comparison that was then reiterated over and over again by Zaka. Even the ISIS people would never done this what they did. It's even worse than ISIS. However, a comparison between the two groups is a groundless stretch that has no substance. Hamas is a Palestinian political party and resistance group based in Gaza that won democratic elections in the enclave in 2006, whereas Daesh is a terrorist organization that originated in Syria and Iraq. However, Israel's goal in equating the two is to justify its killings of civilians under Hamas rule. Just like the US-led anti-Daesh coalition swayed the public into accepting the killing of thousands of civilians during Washington's anti-terror operations across Syria and Iraq. Given the work it does for the state of Israel, the group has been referred to as an invaluable part of Israel's propaganda machine. The uh, government of Israel sees uh, organizations like Zaka as a kind of uh, propaganda arm. And of course, you can see that very much makes sense when you look at the, uh, the US um, branch of Zaka, which is registered in New York, and one of the advisors on it is a guy called Stuart Seldovitz, who came to prominence uh, last year after uh, Alex the Flood was launched, when he was taunting a halal cart vendor uh, in New York. You know why? If we killed 4,000 Palestinian kids, you know what? It wasn't enough. So what we see here is uh, a, a part of a, uh, an international governmental propaganda apparatus, and uh, I, I guess that's really what significance of uh, Zaka is. Zaka's atrocity propaganda played a key role in Israel's post-October 7 Hasbara campaign. It deviated people's attention from Israel's intelligence, political and military failure in preventing the Hamas attacks, and justified Tel Aviv's all-out war against Gaza. Critics have accused Western media of playing hand-in-glove with Zaka to whitewash Israeli war crimes. Several mainstream US media outlets relied heavily on testimonies from Zaka, showed clear bias by highlighting Israeli perspectives, willingly and willfully dehumanized Palestinians, and continued to portray Israel as the victim and Palestinians the aggressors, even amid the facts on the ground in Gaza. These crafted narratives, well orchestrated and perfectly timed, had real life consequences.